The stock market is drooping for a third day here. Marketplace Morning Report is supported by TD Ameritrade. You can check out TD Ameritrade Mobile and Thinkorswim Mobile to find the app that matches your investing style. Hey, David Brancaccio here. First, the uh, chief executives of Twitter, Facebook, and Google will appear on screens before a Senate committee hearing this morning. They're expected to urge caution in any attempts to alter what are called Section 230 protections, which currently shield Internet companies from liability for content displayed on their platforms. Marketplace's Nova Safo is here. This is a hearing of the Senate Commerce Committee. Republicans, especially the president, have been critical, alleging without any clear evidence that social media companies have been suppressing conservative speech. Now, Republican senators are expected to focus on that and whether Section 230 gives Internet companies too much leeway to moderate speech as they see fit. Senate Democrats, as we talked about yesterday, David, released a report about how big tech is affecting local news and whether they should be paying for news content. We'll likely hear about that. So there's going to be a lot discussed today. And these tech bosses, how do they see this? They're going to emphasize how critical they think Section 230 law is to the foundation of the Internet as we know it. It protects companies from being held liable for what people say on their platforms. In prepared remarks, we know Google's Sundar Pichai will urge caution in any attempts to revise Section 230. Twitter's Jack Dorsey will say that changing the law could, quote, collapse how we communicate on the Internet. And Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg will echo that point, but also say... His company supports some bipartisan reform proposals, for example, around more transparency. Nova, thank you. People were more in the mood to splash out on purchases toward the end of summer, but now it appears consumer confidence is stalling. A slight decline was reported this week by an industry group, the Conference Board. That's with COVID cases soaring in parts of the country and no new pandemic relief out of Washington for now. As Marketplace's Mitchell Hartman reports, when it comes to coping with the pandemic economy, one's age often matters. The research firm Morning Consult finds that baby boomers are more pessimistic about the future than millennials. Economist John Lear says for a 55 or 60 year old out of work looking ahead to retirement. The time that older Americans have to make up their lost savings, their lost income is much shorter than it is for younger adults. Older Americans are also more leery of going out in the pandemic to shop at the mall, go to the gym, take a trip. Robert Frick sees the impact his generation is having. He's an economist at Navy Federal Credit Union, 63 years old. For myself and for my friends, we are very cautious. We aren't traveling. We're not going to restaurants. We're not spending. Younger people, unfortunately, they're not in as good a financial condition, but they are traveling and spending more. Frick says older professional workers and retirees have done pretty well financially, with the value of assets like stocks, homes, and retirement accounts up in the pandemic. I'm Mitchell Hartman for Marketplace. The Dow fell 650 points Monday, 222 points yesterday, meaning that index is down 3% week so far, and it's only the dawn of Wednesday. Lack of new pandemic relief in Washington and the prospect of new pandemic lockdowns are part of this. Right now, the Dow future is down 538 points, 2%. The S&P future is down 1.7%. And one way to think about stocks is to look out on your street. Oh, see a lot of brown delivery vans? UBS said today its profits and sales surged in that last quarter with people ordering online. Profits are up 14%. Drug makers Sanofi and GlaxoSmithKline have signed on to give 200 million doses of its possible coronavirus vaccine to COVAX. That's a system set up to help ensure that all countries get vaccine when and if it's available, not just the countries developing the drugs. This Sanofi Glaxo candidate is in its early stage testing, and the hope is approval maybe sometime next year. Marketplace Morning Report is supported by Indeed, committed to helping businesses find candidates with the right skills for critical roles so managers can focus on hiring the person who is a good fit. Learn more at Indeed.com slash credit. Income inequality is on the minds of many voters right now, much like the run-up to the 1968 presidential election. With politicians making promises to level the playing field, back in 68, some Republicans said they would, quote, liberate the poor by modifying welfare work requirements. Democrats then were promising to build on civil rights legislation. And after that campaign was over 52 years ago, what happened to these promises? Marketplace's Nancy Marshall Genzer looks at that. 
After Richard Nixon wins the 1968 presidential election, he gets to work on a Republican promise to attack the root causes of poverty, agreeing to support a basic income payment tied to work. Ken Hughes is a historian at the University of Virginia. But, you know, it cost a lot, so he really wasn't for it and just, you know, expected it to die in committee, and it did. Congress was controlled by the Democrats. It did give Nixon the authority to freeze wages and prices to get roaring inflation under control. But the 68 party platform said Republicans would avoid wage and price controls. And we know from the Nixon White House tapes that Nixon didn't believe in them. Here he is talking to his Treasury Secretary, John Connolly. It's fuzzy. So rough translation, Nixon says, the difficulty with wage price controls is the things will not work. Still, here's Nixon in a primetime TV address just six months later. I am today ordering a freeze on all prices and wages throughout the United States. Ultimately, says Alan Mattiso, a fellow at Rice University's Baker Institute, Nixon pursued whatever economic policy he thought would help him politically. Whatever the situation is, he's playing it for its political angle. And it led to many inconsistencies in his policies. Nixon was consistent on Republican promises of a crusade against crime. Systemic racism persisted. Democrats had promised to spur the pace of urban renewal. That stalled. Adrian Lent Smith, who teaches African-American studies at Duke University, says most black home buyers were stuck in rundown, segregated neighborhoods. The houses that they were getting were often in terrible condition and in neighborhoods that were only marginally getting city services. Nixon did work with the Democratic Congress on some issues. Still, Democrats' 1968 promises to build on earlier civil rights gains largely evaporated. I'm Nancy Marshall Genzer for Marketplace. A lot will happen between now and later on today on our Business Economics Workplace and Innovation Beats. Listen for my colleague Kai Rizdahl. He's host of Marketplace on many public radio stations or streaming at marketplace.org. I'm David Brancaccio with our Morning Report. From APM, American Public Media.